So um, I'm from Lausanne in Switzerland. Um, and the title of my talk you just heard, the short talk title is um, Cryo-Electron Microscopy in Lausanne, to set this up there. The Nobel Prize for Cryo-Electron Microscopy was given 2017 for these three gentlemen, as we all know, Jacques Dubouché, Joachim Frank, and Richard Henderson. And Jacques Dubouché is from Lausanne. Um, after having invented cryo-EM at the EMBL, um, at least uh, uh, worked on the plunge freezing method, that then um, is the method we all use today. He moved to Lausanne and uh, had a lab in the University of Lausanne um, here in the biology building um, um, where he worked on the retirement uh, 10 years ago. And he still lives in Lausanne and um, comes by every two weeks or so in our lab now. And the EPFL is a federally funded, um, uh, technically oriented high school in Lausanne that is just next door of the University of Lausanne. And after this Nobel Prize in 2017, they had a Nobel Prize ceremony and decided together these two campuses, the locally canton funded university and the federally funded EPFL, to set up um, cryo-electron microscopy in Lausanne. And they recruited me for this purpose, to come to Lausanne and do this. Um, so this was based on the two campuses, um, University of Lausanne and EPFL. And soon later, the University of Geneva also joined. And now we have um, the three universities together in the Stubusche Center Initiative. There was an honorary committee founded and the presidents of the first two universities and then the third one um, moved this whole thing forward and they invested significantly into this. And I was tasked to set this up as a facility for these three universities and then also just the French speaking part of Switzerland and, and beyond. So the first task we have to address is what do we want to do in a cryo-electron microscopy facility? And you see here the current um, main pillars of cryo-EM. The first one, the big blockbuster is single particle electron microscopy, cryo-EM and also helical falls through this. Um, everybody's doing this. The second one is tomography. And the third one is CLEM, I will come to these. Um, and then there's MicroED, but MicroED is the expertise of uh, the cryo-electron microscopy facility in Geneva. And so our Geneva colleagues, who are now also part of the Dubusche Center, um, take over the MicroED for this Dubusche Center. So the workflow in single particle, as we all know, is that somebody has to do the hard work and purify a protein. We record movies of these proteins and then classification sorts this out into different orientations and different classes. And we make a 3D reconstruction. Um, that's the general workflow. The detail of course is very tricky. The protein is in different conformations and um, with different fragments there or missing or so. And here's an example from the literature. It's not our work. It's just what I picked from the literature molecular cell um, a few months ago where they had a very impressive workflow of how they started with lots of different data sets that they all expressed and purified in different conditions or with different mutations or so in different components of this complex present. And then with image processing and all these different um, data sets, they figured out um, the overall map of the complex and did then local refinement of the individual molecules um, to get an overall high resolution map, which is this blue one here. And then in that map, you would start with model building. And so this is so an example that is not just about making a 3D reconstruction from data, it's also to answer a biological question. And for that, you may need lots of structures and you need lots of image processing tips and tricks that need as well the biological knowledge as it needs the computational knowledge and over and over access again to the data set to do the microscopes. So it's not just about a facility that records movies, it's about answering the biological problems. And so the workflow is more or less here on the left side, you need, somebody has to make the protein and that's luckily done by others in most cases and make sure the protein is healthy and homogeneous and stable. And then you start with negative stain, which the Dubushi center is probably able to do or is able to do, but that can also be done in other facilities that people have in the university or in the EPFL or in Geneva. And then in the Dubusche Center, you would have the big machines in our case to optimize grids, to collect movies, and then also to make a first three reconstruction running any of these live uh, software packages, CryoSpark Live or Reliant 4 or 
Um, our focus software can also be helpful for this. But then the hard work comes later also. What about this 3D particle classification focused model building? Model building, atomic model building at all, and then the functional interpretation of the data. This cannot be done by the facility because we don't have the, the capacity. Somebody has to sit for months and interpret this, and it's very hard for a facility to satisfy lots of customers. So somehow this has to be given back to the clients, but then they don't have the expertise. And there is a problem that one has to address when setting up such a facility. The other topic is um, AlphaFold 2 that was, uh, as we know, published a few months ago. AlphaFold 2 is a competition for single particle cryo -EM. Instead of spending weeks and months on uh, making an atomic model for your protein, you could also just, in some cases, look it up in the database. But that rarely answers your, your biological question about the mechanism of the protein. And for that, you need all these different subunits and different buffers and different ligands and different functional states and mutations and so to see how the protein works in the cell and contributes to health and disease. And so in my opinion, AlphaFold 2 is not a competition for us uh, in cryo microscopy, but is rather helpful because this tedious model building of the first initial model, that can now be done by AlphaFold 2. You take the AlphaFold 2 model as a starting model for uh, your model building and then merge it into your data set in the different confirmations. So I think AlphaFold 2 is only taking the boring part of cryo-EM pipeline away, but the interesting part, answering the biological questions, that is actually helped by AlphaFold 2. The second topic is electron tomography. We have the same pipeline here. Um, and again, the Dubosch Center, in our case, is active in the middle. So sample preparation, including high pressure freezing, uh, can be very well done by other labs here in Lausanne. Christelle Genou is here and Graham Not, and they have sample preparation very well under control. The Dubosch Center would then do tomography at high resolution. And then a first 3D reconstruction is easy, but then doing subvolume analysis and 3D subvolume classification and refinement, that is very time consuming and complicated. And there, somebody needs to have the expertise and the biological insight where you need the close interaction between your facility and the customer, but the customer will have to be, need training. So somebody has to train these. And that is an issue when you set up such a facility. The third topic is CLEM, correlative light and electron microscopy. That is where all the biology and medicine and the answers come from. You know, how can you identify your protein of interest or your complex of interest in the tissue um, label technology is very important there. And then FIPSEM correlated, FIPSEM correlated super resolution light microscopy in cryo, hopefully with uh, cryo AEM or cryotomography. That is where the biology and medicine comes from. And one also has to decide what role your facility has towards CLEM. How do you interface with atomic force microscopy or existing other X ray synchrotron tomography, whatever methods? Correlated methods, I think, will grow, and everybody in our community knows that this will grow significantly. And yeah, so I think at the moment, the blockbuster is single particle and it drifts more and more to the right in the near future. So a facility then has to address these three pillars. And you have to decide how do you deal with biosafety? Yeah? So in our case, in the Dubusha Center in Luzan, we all can, of course, work on biosafety level one, which is the trivial case. Biosafety level two, we can do to a certain extent. Yeah, so um, we cannot deal with large BSL2 samples or P2 safety samples, but we can, uh, we have a P BSL2 room where we can take such salmonella bacteria or other bacteria and prepare grids. And the frozen grid with a few nanoliters of sample on it under liquid nitrogen is in most facilities okay to transport to a, a cryo -EM image it and take it out and then discard it in a controlled way. Um, so here we are in the gray zone where you have to deal with your, or negotiate with your safety officers on your campus, how to deal with BSL2. In our case, BSL3 and 4 is clearly a no-go. We don't do that. We don't want to do that. There's specialists, facilities elsewhere in the, in the world that, that can work with that. Um, setting up a facility was one task. And then um, I also 
set up my lab. My lab is in physics, and then my lab we develop methods to advance uh, cryo microscopy. I will not speak about this here. I will speak about the Dubusha Center only. And the Dubusha Center, it's about establishing a high performance facility, and their resolution matters. It is not enough to reach 3.5 angstroms. The field has advanced to more and more towards 2.5 or 2 angstrom resolution, and that is useful to be able to, to find drugs in a, a structure. And if you want to do chemistry, you need even higher resolution. Um, the operator is very important, sometimes more important than the, than the instruments. There are some cases, if you look them up in the EMDB database, where people with the glass microscope, 200 kilovolt, Gabe Lander, for example, reach higher resolution than the average structure determined on Titan cryosis. Yeah? So the first task for a good facility is to find awesome people, technical experts that are good with clients and good, good people and socially team working and so. And I think this was super successful here in Lausanne. Alex Miasnikov is the head of our facility and he's joined by Bertrand Beckard, Imiko Ushikawa and Sergei Nazarov, who are awesome experts all able to do model building and single particle, uh, the entire pipeline uh, grid preparation. And so, so we have a super competent crew with a stellar head. And we have Radosav Pantelic to advance the technology. Radosav Pantelic before has developed the ELA, uh, Dectris camera and the ELSA sample holder for Gatan. And he's now here to advance methods um, as technology development. Um, you all know about uh, the breakthroughs in the technology that we had recently. The race lock B factor in this graph is, is a measure that um, is a way to quantify electron microscope performance. And if you want to buy electron microscopes, you have to make a choice. Do you go for Thermo Fisher, Titan, or do you go for GO cryo arms? And in my opinion, both are very close to each other. Both have advantages and disadvantages. Yeah? So, in, um, Thermo Fisher is, is an approved pipeline, goes from Vitrobot to EPU. Um, but then it's also very facility and industry client oriented and sometimes difficult to go to the basic functions of the machine. Whereas the dual cryo arm gives you more access to the, to the base level functionalities, which in some cases is better if you want to custom uh, tune some scripts in COEM or so and have full accessibility to everything as your instrument. Um, the jewels are taller, you need higher room height. Um, so you have to go and visit both factories and speak with both, and it's worth doing that because both companies, in my opinion, are very close to each other. So it's clearly not easy for me to make a decision. We chose Titan Cryosis, called Field Emission Gun Selectors X and Falcon 4 um, for the Dubusha Center, and this is now working here. So we have three machines in the Dubusha Center, for the time being because of space reasons. Um, and there's additional facilities already existing here that have negative stain machines next door. And in my lab, we do method development on these two machines. We have to find a solution to user fees. How much do you charge your clients? And if you start new cryem in some university, in my case, the university was assuming X-ray or material sciences user fees which typically are much higher because in material sciences, microscopes do not run around the clock. So I had to speak with different people here on campus and explain that in cryo-EM, microscopes essentially run 24 seven, except they go out sometimes, so that we have much more hours on the clock and therefore the user fees can be cheaper than in other facilities here on campus. And you have to establish user fees 29 francs an hour, which is like 27 euros an hour for, for us here for uh, members who funded the instruments and other academia pays 20% overhead and industry has then higher rates. Um, you have to set up computing hardware. We set up computing hardware in the Dubusha Center. Alex Miasnikov and his team does this to perform on the fly processing. But this is not hardware that is able to do all the image processing for all the clients. For that, we have a computer center on campus that has massive computing resources. And that is where clients will do the processing themselves. But the Dubushi Center is at least equipped with these eight GPU machines to do occasional jobs and to teach and to help students. You have to find a, a site where you can set up your facility. 
Um, so this is the EPFL and the university on the beautiful Lake Geneva, and here's the beach, and here's the sailing boats, and so. Um, and when you start measuring electromagnetic fields, Marco Cantoni helped us, you find out that the metro and some underground power cables are actually problems. And so you choose then a location where you want to build your very nice facility, but then Corona strikes and everything is delayed by a few years in this case, Corona and politics. And so in this case, then we use the building that is sandwiched between the high power cable and the metro and said, okay, we try our luck here in this building. And in very short time, set up this temporary facility and using the company's help, Systron AG from Zurich. We installed active uh, field cancellation systems, which are not so expensive and managed to get the electromagnetic fields under control. And the other facility will be ready in a year or so. And then the new facility, we have space for six instruments. And here we have space for three Dubosche Center instruments, plus the two from my lab. And this all with UPS and transformers and water chillers and computer servers and sample prep and all that. On the second floor in both facilities is a operator room for remote control of all instruments from a room with windows and fridge and radio running and a copy machine. So what you have to address when setting up a facility is this list. You have to motivate the presidents of the university to give you the funding. And that is investment and running costs. You have to organize the organizational structure. So who decides on further investments in the future? You have to negotiate the user fees with your campus and the access rights. In our case, everybody from every lab, including mine and everybody else is in the same waiting line. You have to recruit and headhunt the best experts in the world. That is almost as, as important or actually more important than finding the right instruments. This is the key element in my opinion, to find people like Alex Miasnikov and everybody I have here with his team. Then you have to find the location, which is difficult if there hasn't been any electron microscopy facility before um, because of the technical requirements, yeah? electromagnetic interference, vibrations, cooling water quality, ventilation, and so on. You have to negotiate the electron microscopes with both Thermo Fisher and Geo. You have to set up all the auxiliary things, yeah? plungers, vitrobots, spotted on or cryosol or cryowriter, FIPSEM, Aquilos 2, whatever, CLEM hardware and establish workflows. You have to deal with the computing hardware, starting with the network speed, 10 gigabits, lines, uh, GPU clusters, terabytes, so petabytes of storage and so, and establish the workflows in terms of online processing and so on. So, um, these are the Dubusche Center people that are an awesome team here. It's fun to work with them and watch them. And Alex is the, really the right person to leave, move this forward. And I'm very happy to work with them. And the rest are collaborators from my labs and my own lab. So thank you for your attention. And that's what I wanted to show you so far. Thank you, Mats Henning, for the fantastic talk, for being on time. And I wish I had this presentation one and a half year ago before start, starting my journey. <laughs> uh, now I will uh, go through the Q&A. Um, uh, what is the best, uh, Thomas Koba, uh, what is the best solution for ground foundations for the cryogen facility regarding anti-vibration properties? So in our case, we have these two facilities. Let me just share my screen again. Um, we have these two facilities and um, in, in this facility, we had no time. So we just put the electro microscopes on the ground and they're close to the metro. And so um, the microscopes perform according to specs, even when the metro passes, yeah, but we can hear the, the subway or the metro passing by, but the microscopes are still fine. So um, that's Thermo Fisher Titans. I think we are at the limit with vibrations. The Joel microscopes, uh, Joel told me that they actually do not want an active uh, vibration isolation system underneath their instruments because they are afraid that this would just get into um, resonance with their own anti-vibration um, devices in the microscope, in the cryo arm 300. So you have to speak with the company and have them measure the floor vibrations and see if you have to isolate a big concrete block on springs or on some piezo systems, but that becomes quickly very expensive. 
um, or if you can just go on the ground and live with it. So a new facility we construct from the ground up, and this facility will be separate from everything else and far away from the subway. So there's no vibrations at the moment, and we are physically decoupled with rubber from the rest of the building. And there, I think we should start fine. And we will also just have a concrete floor and put the microscopes onto that floor. So no swinging concrete blocks. Swinging concrete blocks can cause trouble if you want to roll your microscope in and the height is going up and down and you have an edge and it's complicated. The double floor is also helpful, but it's complicated to keep this under control. So yeah, we go the easy way this way, this time. Thanks a lot. Uh, then we have another question from, sorry if I butcher your name, Yaganath Sapati. In the current era, uh, the cryo EM made a breakthrough to achieve near to one angstrom resolution, but how could we decrease the timeline for experimentation and image processing time to obtain the structure very fast instead of such a long process? So image processing goes faster each time and is accelerating almost as much as the cameras go. Um, the new microscopes have a better Riesler B factor, which means that uh, you need less particles for, for a certain resolution. And then the cameras get faster and faster. Falcon 4, I know what the K3s are amazing things and direct electron is also very impressive cameras. Um, I think it's just a race where each one tries to keep up with the other one. CryoSpark Live is, or CryoSpark is very, very fast and efficient and also Reliant is getting faster each time. So, but the pipeline has to broaden in the end. Um, also in terms of how many petabytes you need in the end to, to satisfy the output of one Titan for a few years, you're quickly reaching six petabytes for three machines. It's a race, but typically you invest 10 times more into the electron microscope in, than into the computing hardware. So it's a minor problem, but it's still one you have to address. And we have a question from Paul Simpson. Given you have three high-end microscopes with service contract and staff cost, how are you able to offer such low rates? So in our case, we purchased the microscopes with seven years of warranty. That offsets all the problems to the future eight years after acceptance of the machines. That's one way to approach the low rates. Um, the rates are low, but if you run this thing from Friday evening to Monday morning, you get 70 hours or so, you still pay a lot. Yeah? Industry clients pay more. And then um, if you look at our the plans for the personal. There's also a position for a service engineer, a factory trained service engineer. If you get um, Joel instruments, you can speak with Joel. If Joel wants to um, appoint somebody to work on your site or the term official, you could try the same. And that would be a way to um, also reduce the service contracts. Yeah? Um, for example, in the EMBL, Wim Hagen is uh, factory trained and I think uh, that is a way to get them very um, beneficial conditions in your negotiations with the company. So you could try to lower your service contracts if you can offer them something that has real value. Um, yeah, and I think our user fees are actually reasonable. They're not cheap. Um, Zurich is, for example, cheaper. Um, yeah. Then Sonia Welsh asks, I noticed that the control areas are in the microscope rooms, not in separate rooms with daylight. Is this on purpose or did you have no other choice? Um, so in this facility, which was just a temporary fix, there's a staircase here. The staircase leads up to a room that is up here that has four consoles next to each other. And then on the other side for um, the terminals for image processing. And so here you can sit and operate four electron microscopes, namely these four, um, all from this room with daylight and the fridge and the coffee machine and, and the TV and music and so if you want. And we have glass fiber connections from each microscope directly one to one, three lines um, to these consoles and then have the original hand panels in the original quality here. And what is very funny is when you have Alex sitting on the microscope and aligning the microscope and I go to this, you have one-to-one -one control of this. And when I just move the mouse by half, by a few pixels, so that when Alex wants to click on a button and I just move the mouse by a little bit so that he misses the button and almost clicks next to it. And then he goes crazy. And then I have to quickly run and excuse myself. But, but it shows that this panel and this panel here have the original one-to-one -one quality. 
Um, and you can use either of the two in parallel. You don't have to switch back and forth. It's super comfortable with Thermo Fisher. So we bought these additional panels and fed them up here with fiber optic connections to each microscope. And the same will be here on the new facility. Um, so just as a follow up, since this is coming also from Sonia, uh, how are competing interests handled with multiple users in one control room, I guess, meaning are users comfortable with being? Yeah, if, if a user needs confidentiality, for example, an industry client doesn't want that the competition learns which body in their work on, then we don't use the remote control and use the local one, but EPU runs or CRM runs automatically anyway. Otherwise, um, you could say that you collect data and don't do image processing for a customer. You know, if the customer doesn't want you to see the drug that is bound to their molecule or so, you could say we only do data collection and give you the raw data. And otherwise, uh, we have professional people here, the Dubusha Center people are permanently employed professionals. They do confidentiality between clients. Um, if you have students from different labs that compete with each other, sitting next to each other, then I think we have to solve it differently by having them working locally. But that's a situation that is unhealthy anyway. Uh, you should collaborate with your neighbors and not co compete with your neighbors on the same protein. That would be idiotic. Yeah, and I hope that nobody in the world has to do that. Yeah. Be sorry for those people. And then very quickly, so that we answer all live from Ludo Renault. I believe you purchased prop corrected instruments. Is that correct? Are they stable enough for routine facility work? Do they present advantages or bio for biological samples? Um, so for the Dubusha Center, we have just normal um, cold fag electron sources and then selectors X and Falcon 4 and this one. This one is probe corrected. It will, as far as I know, be one of the first, if not the first probe corrected Titan cryos. Uh, with a CS corrector above the sample. And that is for a research uh, method development project, not for data collection. So that will be diffractive imaging and it will also have an RF cavity in the gun. Um, that's a different, that's a research project. So we will probably have very little uptime with this microscope and usually take it apart and have the wires all hanging out. And so the microscope is not yet delivered. That will arrive in March next year. And I'm very much looking forward to working with that and trying new approaches to cryo -EM. It's a high risk project for method development. That's great. Looking forward to see what will come out of that project. Thanks a lot, Henning, uh, for answering all the questions. In the meantime, I will ask uh, the next speaker, Elizabeth, uh, to bring up her presentation. And uh, in the meantime, someone is asking if they are allowed to take screenshots. Well, all speakers of today have allowed recording of the session, so I assume they're fine with it. But please, each of you, you know, you can, of course, withdraw, um, uh, withdraw this permission uh, if you don't feel comfortable. I'm with me, and I think science should be open usually. <laughs> Okay. And, and maybe, Henning, there is also another question from so Paul Simpson. If you uh, you can type your answer uh, so that everyone can see in the Q and A um, function of uh, webinar. Okay, and welcome to Elizabeth Wright uh, from University of Wisconsin Medicine. And the title of the talk will be um, "Small, Medium, and Large: Building a Multi-Scale Cryo-EM Facility." Elizabeth, the stage is yours. Great. Thank you, and thank you for the organizers uh, for giving me the opportunity to talk about what we've been building here in Madison for the last uh, three years. So three years ago, I moved to, to Madison, Wisconsin from Emory University to build uh, one cryo-EM center, but in the meantime, I've, I've been building two. So I'll give you a little bit of an idea of what we've been up to um, during this time. So, when I came here, there was really, there were great plans, lots of funding like Henning alluded to that this is where you need your partners to come together to, to secure resources to, to build a project of this magnitude. And, but we had a lot of empty rooms. We knew we had to do a lot of renovations uh, so that we can regulate temperature and humidity uh, to manage acoustics and vibration, EMI cancellation. 
and also a lot to be able to do network upgrades because this is really critical for the microscopes to be able to uh, send their data out uh, to the network uh, so that people can process their data. So when we started, uh, we had microscopes and crates, uh, rooms barely started renovating, but then last year we, we did a lot of work during COVID to, to get them or half the resource up and running uh, to start working with, with clients. And so here we are at UW-Madison, simple email or web address, cryoem.wisc.edu. This is really a great interface for the two centers. So we have the CEMRC, which is our UW-Madison center. This is a fee-for-service center. Uh, we take clients from uh, everywhere. So academia, industry, government labs. Uh, then we also have the portal for MSET. So this is the NIH a uh, national lab for cryo-electron tomography. Uh, so we're the hub center for, for four centers that have come together to build this particular network. We have a lot of resources on here to get people training in cryo-EM, uh, helping them understand protocols, what services uh, that we offer, and give them some indication of you know, where they need to go in the field. So, uh, we really couldn't do this, I couldn't do this alone. And so we have a great administrative team of Keith Thompson, Matt Larson and myself. And so we do a lot of logistical support for the, the two centers here, <clears throat> um, not only on the community, on the campus community, but the national network for CryoET, uh, because this is two different centers running simultaneously to support users with very different experimental uh, plans and, and goals. Uh, we guide the users through uh, the two application processes and onboarding them into the resources so they can get the training and support to the microscopes that they need. Uh, we provide them with everything that they would hope to ask for. Uh, so how to prepare specimens, collect data, uh, process this data and manage this data, not only when they're in the facility with us, but as they, they go out uh, to their, their own network uh, and the resources that they have to manage their computation on, on their side. And so we support users as they come in to start using the, the resources, but also as they close out projects and begin to, to design new ones. So where are we located? Well, I guess on the US map, we're in, in Wisconsin and in particular in Madison, Wisconsin. And so, as I mentioned, we have two websites. So the main one, uh, cryoem.wis.edu, but the national network has its own portal at cryoetportal.org. A little bit uh, scaled down view of where we are. So we're, we're in a kind of an exciting place on campus. We're in the heart of the science and engineering corridor. Uh, so all the biological sciences are in this area and right across the street, we have the great engineering and computer science school. And we really collaborate with them a lot. Uh, when we first came to Madison, the, the EM facilities that we were using were actually the EM facilities before we, we built our own. And so they're a great group of people to connect with and, and think about how to do interface biology with material science samples. And so we're all located in the biochemistry complex. And so this is three buildings, but we have taken over two of these buildings. Uh, we couldn't have one contiguous space, uh, but I actually think this has some benefits. As Henning was alluding to, you can kind of have clients or users separated depending on if there are confidentiality concerns, or we also, where we have our L120 instrument, uh, it's located in a shared uh, biophysical instrumentation facility and optical core. And so this gives people who are using those uh, technologies the, the opportunity to engage with us at the EM level so that they can think about how to add those experiments into their workflows. So as I mentioned, we're in, in multiple different locations. Uh, so CEMRC is the Cryo-EM Research Center. That was the first center we started building. And uh, we're located in three spaces and two buildings. Uh, so this one on the the left-hand side here is where the Creos is. The L120 is up above. And then in a completely separate building, we have the Artica and Aquilos, as well as uh, instrumentation space. And then we have taken over two additional spaces uh, for the National Lab. So that's MSET, the Midwest Center for Cryo-Electron Tomography. So there we have a larger computational 
lab and, and offices to support users when they come to campus so that they can engage with us and each other to think about uh, cryo-EM and, and the science they're developing. And then we have the, the two new microscopes and a huge uh, uh, dry slash wet lab facility to process samples. So the instrumentation uh, for this resource, we, we went with uh, Thermo Fisher instruments. You know, there's, as Henning mentioned, there's a lot of options, but as we were developing streamlined workflows for users, this was uh, the path we went forward to, and it's been very, uh, been working very well for us uh, to move people through the pipeline. So to begin with, we have the L120, the Talos Artica, the Creos 3GI, and the FibSim. Uh, and for the National Center, we'll have the Creos G4, uh, an Aquilos 2, and a Leica CryoClim. This will be the Leica CryoConfocal Clem system. And so how do people access the resources? Well, CEMRC, uh, everyone can just contact us on this email. We can begin discussion about a project and how to use instruments. We have an online form, sample submission form, of course. Uh, a user would need to provide their biosafety protocol. We do BSL-1 and, and 2 uh, laboratory work for people. And all of our billing and invoicing is through iLab and how people schedule their time on the instruments. So people just generate an iLab account to be able to connect with us and secure time on any equipment that they need. We are a first come first served facility. And as I mentioned, we're available to academic industry and government laboratories. This has worked well. We're able to, right now, we don't have uh, a vast user base, so we can schedule people really, really quickly uh, since we've been onboarding people through this, this COVID operations time. Um, you know, this has given us some flexibility uh, in, in how many users we're bringing in. But I say right now, we're training on campus users. We have about 30 to 40 users that were in active levels of training them to use the various tools to uh, support their use of the equipment uh, for their projects. For the Midwest Center and the National Network, we have an online application uh, system for people to, to submit applications. And this is a, yeah, the resources of the National Network are free for users in academia, industry, and government labs. You just have to apply, the applications are reviewed, and then you're distributed amongst the, the four national centers to start your sample preparation and data collection and training uh, needs. And so for that process, applications are taken on a, a quarterly basis. So what are our capabilities? Uh, like everyone, we can do single particle uh, tomography, micro ED, cryofib, and cryoclem. We use a lot of different uh, software packages depending on the user's comfort. Uh, so EPU uh, and Cerulean for single particle. Uh, we have Tomo and Cerulean for, for tomography. Uh, our preference is to use Cerulean for tomography data collection. And most of our, I'd say we're half and half uh, between EPU and Cerulean for single particle. Uh, we have APHIS on all of the instruments. Uh, fringe freeze coming for the new uh, Creos and Volta phase plates for the three systems. I didn't put it down, I apologize. We also have stem detectors on the, the two Creos uh, systems. So our pipeline is really facilitated by a GUI interface that Matt Larson developed. And we uh, have a seamless automated pre-processing uh, workflow for people to use. Uh, for single particle, we run CryoSpark Live to give on the fly feedback to us and our users of how things are going. Uh, for tomography, our auto processing pipeline is coming soon. And remote controls on a case by case basis, it really depends. Uh, a lot of times we'll just set up um, a team viewer to uh, screen grids with the client and get their input. And then we, we start the data collection. And so here's our data collection interface that everyone starts with on the, the microscope. So this really supports project management on the instruments and all the metadata is cataloged for database entry. So we have this little uh, button that you click on. And so you can pick either EPU or Serial EM for your data collection type. 
uh, the different instruments you're working on, uh, what's the biosafety level, for example, grid type, et cetera, and uh, you know, how you coordinate uh, through uh, the, the directory tree, your data collection. So here we can enter the specifics for the optical parameters of the microscope and the particular imaging parameters. And so everyone can select these different uh, fields uh, based on your particular experiment uh, and, and how you're collecting your, your data sets. Finally, uh, you, you transition to uh, where your data is gonna be stored and how you wanna do your pre-processing and processing workflow. We do for all of them, the uh, frame alignment and CTF estimation. As I mentioned, we do some pre-processing uh, for the, the single particle, but we're not, well, I mean, processing, uh, rapid processing for single particle, but we're not there yet with tomography. And so uh, overview of our computation. And so here's how we're set up. Uh, all the microscopes are linked by fiber to our, our processing servers uh, and, our, and our storage cluster. Uh, so we have these 10 gig fiber links that have our automated processing servers. So this is where we do all the pre-processing and the on the fly CryoSpark Live processing to give people a rapid feedback. The data is automatically, once it's been pre-processed, sent to the CEPH storage cluster. Uh, we learned about the CEPH system from our friends at Aarhus. And this is really a fantastic, very flexible, expandable system. We add additional, uh, so a number of our user clients, we've added storage nodes for them on it, as well as co uh, compute nodes uh, that can interface with this. So it's really a, a great uh, system to, to manage your data. Uh, everything goes into the CEPH storage cluster. So right now this is sitting at 1.5 petabytes of active space. Uh, we are using Globus for our data transfer. Uh, so sometimes people use it for particular groups that are kind of internal to campus, but all our external users, we, we use Globus for this. Uh, within the facility, uh, we have a number of cryo-EM workstations. These are GPU workstations. I know those are Macs there, but we actually have some Linux machines as well. Um, and so we have a number of different options for people to do uh, computation in the, the laboratory space with the staff. Um, we also have access to the Center for High Throughput Computing. So if people have more extensive computational needs, they can utilize this resource. It's managed by a completely different group on campus, uh, and, uh, but we're facilitating the connectivity between them. So there's multiple options for how users can process their data. They can take it away um, and, you know, just give us feedback of how data collection went. So training options, uh, we have lots of different opportunities for people. So during COVID, obviously, uh, many of our ways we were classically training people, which is typically hands-on, were minimized. So we developed a lot of written and online tutorials and protocols to get people up to speed on how to use, uh, you know, go from negative stain, grid handling, to, to cryo-EM grid preparation uh, and, and some of our imaging workflows. And so all of the members of the, the facility have really been working to develop these protocols uh, to support users. Uh, now within the last six months, I would say we've been able to do minimal hands-on training with people. And so this is where we have this, this user group expanding. Uh, we haven't had any workshops yet, but these are coming in 2022. I can't believe I'm saying 2022 because you know, it seems too far away. Um, but yeah, we're expecting our first workshop to be probably uh, in the summer of, of 2022. Uh, all of us who are interested in cryo-EM, I think we typically have some aspect of technology development within our resources. Uh, our emphasis, well, my passion is, I guess, thinking about how to improve things for tomography. So we do a lot of work with substrate micropatterning, correlation, and cryofibsim. This is really uh, kind of critical to the national network mission as well for cryo-ET is to make these, uh, uh, I guess, experimental workflows more accessible to users who may not have as much experience in the EM and cryo-EM methodologies. 
And so one of the reasons we use the micropatterning is we can really define the placement of cells on the EM grids uh, so that we can do just simple experiments of, of improving our, our turnover of, of samples that we're imaging, uh, but also to do more elegant experiments where maybe you're looking at cell to cell junctions and other aspects of how cells are communicating with one another. And so this is where we're kind of interested in thinking about how neurons uh, form uh, complex networks and how we can micro pattern substrates to, to take advantage of, of building these large circuitries of, of neurons. And uh, so Joe Kim is a graduate student in my lab and he's been working with a number of different neuron types. In this case, we have Drosophila neurons where he's uh, micro pattern grids to have them on, on the EM grid. Uh, and coordinate their placement. So this has really been fantastic for correlation work, but also cryofibsim, where you can orient uh, your cells based on where you need to have them oriented in the fib, and then for subsequent cryo-ET data collection, uh, and if you have to do CLEM again on the, the back end. Uh, now he's gone into developing more elegant uh, patterns so that he can really begin to uh, make these neural networks on, on the grids. So what has been the scope of our, our cryoEM project here at UW-Madison? Well, onboarding six full-time staff scientists, uh, as, as, you know, as Henning mentioned and all of us know, having a really fantastic team of, of scientists to support our users is, is critical. And these, these individuals have been really great to come on board with a brand new facility. Uh, we've commissioned so far three cryoTEMs and one cryofibsim. We're about to start commissioning our second Aqualos just arrived last week. Uh, so we'll get that one going and then the Creos uh, in December. We've built out all the computational resources and get that going, uh, have the streamlined workflows for the user community, benchmark all the microscope performance, and we continue to build the, the two resources as we move forward. So I did, certainly didn't do this in isolation. Uh, really, the of course, uh, financially, this was supported by UW-Madison, the Department of Biochemistry, Mortgage, and, and Wharf. Uh, for the national network, we've been supported by the NIH and our, our grant. Um, and so there's this really fantastic team. You know, Keith, Matt, Jay, Brian, Kai, and Anil are really the, the hub that, that keeps everything going uh, in the resource. And our other colleagues on campus, Janice, Brian, Tim, Rob, and Marissa, really provide us additional guideline, guidance on how we're pushing the envelope with different aspects of our computational resources, uh, developing new tools for computation, and how we're looking at different biological samples uh, throughout the entire uh, cryoEM pipeline. So that is all I have. Again, we're here at cryoem.wis.edu. And thank you for your attention. And now we go on with Paolo uh, Schwetz. I think this is how you pronounce. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well done. <laughs> Great. Okay. From the Human Technical, and the title of Paolo's talk will be Building Human Technical's Cryum Facility, a year in the meeting. And okay. Paolo, the stage is yours. Yeah, actually, I'm speaking after two giants in the field, so I'm a bit like embarrassed, but you know, I'll try to, to not to make myself a fool. Uh, I'm gonna take the next 15, maybe 20 minutes to show you what's going on at Human Technopol. A, because nobody maybe ever heard of Human Technopol, and B, it's because there's something that, you know, I just want to show because we, 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 we had a wild 12 months. Uh, okay, so what's, what's Human Technopol again? So, in Italy, uh, now it's been two years from completely scratch. We actually, they set up uh, the birth of the new life science research institute called Human Technopol. We are based in Milan, in Italy. And here you can see the five groups that are kind of the, the pioneers of human technopol. So we have genomics, computational biology, the public health and healthcare systems, neurogenomics and structural biology research center. One year ago, I was here presenting you our ideas and our intentions. And actually, we, I showed the very same slide, but we had three mysteries, uh, new group leaders. But now, now they're fully announced. They are hiring at all, 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 level, all levels. And we have Anna Casagnal, Francesca Gosch, and Philip Erman. They already started working in the research center. 
uh, exactly one year ago, actually one year and five days, because it was the 12th of October, this was the situation. So the building where I'm actually giving this, this talk is the one you see in the, middle, in the middle picture. And we had nothing. So, and we had, everything had, has to be made. And of course, COVID. So we spent a lot of time at the hospital in the drive-thru getting PCR tests. But I'm happy to say after 12 months that, you know, we, we did a bit, we did something. And all I had and all I was presenting was ideas and shopping lists. So this is kind of the starting package of human technical EM facility, because even though we are called cry EM facility, we provide EM investigation at all levels. So from plastic sections to uh, microelectric diffraction to uh, simple particle electron tomography. So we actually are an EM facility. We start with the very basic, uh, as you say, starting package. So an Aquilus 2, a Cryos G4, Glaciers, but we go into details later. I don't want to waste uh, time here on the slides. We have cryoclam systems. We have uh, all the Leica stuff to, to make sections and plasma cleaners, growth chargers, and, and so on. But no, we're going to go. What happened over the past 12 months? Actually, this was me one year ago. And as you might have heard, uh, pandemic. Zooms, 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 pre international national lockdowns, uh, very strictly limited on site access. And I, today I survived the 12 months in pretty good shape, as you can tell. And so it was November 2020. And actually, this building was not ready at all. All I had is a shielded metal tin can to, to put my uh, our microscopes in. And the entire facility is shielded, not because uh, we're out of the city. We're like in the uh, 2015 Expo area. So we're pretty lucky that we don't get uh, a lot of EMI or vibrations or any other contaminations. So, but still like, even that we started from completely scratch, we decided to, to, to shield the entire facility. Between December and January, I was incredibly lucky to, to kind of, you know, if, you, if you're managing a facility, you know how hard it can be to, to hire good people. And we have two staff scientists. One is Simona Sorrentino, who moved from uh, Zurich, and she's kind of the cryo IT and single particle cryo M expert. And we're waiting for Malan Silva coming from Utah, from HHMI. And he's going to take care more on the cellular and tissue sectioning and uh, imaging. Okay, so the very first microscope to arrive, Human Technoball, actually Human Technoball first ever instrument because it was in February 2021 and we were still at construction site was the, uh, the L120. And actually this was not intentional, I have to say, but it was beautiful because for us it was a way debug. For, you know, we actually made some debugging of the facility. So there were many issues from the water to the power supply to the connection of uh cables that we fixed thanks to the l120 and then we prevented the same issues on the big microscopes i have to say the microscope you know after it took four weeks to to, to install it comes with the cryo box with the katanas a cryo holder with the fissione actually i have to say fissione because it's advanced tomography holder the model 2020 we have clem tomography 5 maps and actually we are users they're, they're ready pretty happy about the microscope it's very stable and i cannot say the same but you know it was not easy to set up negative staining in italy and if you are watching from italy you might be aware of this so it's actually we received the first batch of uranyl uh, salts so formate and acetate a couple of weeks ago and it took me 15 months this is actually the very first task that i started when i joined human technical it took 15 bloody months but you know we made it and um, I think we have uranium acetate for at least a couple of years. So that's another thing that, you know, we, we, could have, we could now offer to our users. In March, 2021, this building, which is the main EM facility building was ready. And as you can see from the picture on the right, basically what we have, we have the three machines on a row in the same open space divided by, um, by some walls. Uh, we have the glaciers, we have the cryos and the aquilos. They are completely isolated. One thing you can see, you can notice in the picture is that 
in order to minimize any airflow, we have this conditioning system with this filter based uh, uh, sealing that is actually can really, like, for example, uh, I don't have to put any, any uh, how you call it, any, any condoms on top of the glaciers. So there's no worry of getting vibrations from the air, which is very good. The other thing you notice here, each microscope sits on a slab, uh, all microscopes. So from the 120 to the Aquilos to the Glacios, they all have their own slab and also all the control rooms are upstairs. So ideally the user will go in for 60 seconds just to load the nanocab and then it will leave. Okay, so the plan with Thermo Fisher was to install everything in three months. Crazy. So <laughs> but it's something that we, we kind of embarked on. Uh, the key here was to negotiate during the negotiations for the intervention of four um, for engineers coming from the factory in Bernou. And actually this was fantastic because we had three teams. The Italian team was working on the Titan and then the two uh, Czech Republic team from the factory were building the Aquilos and the glaciers. And that was fantastic because in less than a month, we have the, the Aquilos up and running. So it's an Aquilos 2 with the Easy Lift and the Auto TM and Slice and View. And actually I was super mega lucky that, you know, we, we uh, that Philip Erdmann decided to come work in here because actually we made the ever first uh, cryo lamella thanks also to, to Philip who was very uh, supportive and it's great to work with, uh, to be honest. Um, in parallel, so I had one team working on the, uh, on the Alpilos, I had another team working on the glaciers. Uh, glaciers, the one that we have here, you can see some standard delivery pictures of sunny Italy and here inside uh, the, 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 the glaciers on, on, the, on the slab position. Um, okay, the same thing I was telling you. So the control room is actually upstairs. So we were actually very lucky that we didn't need any KVM kit because we are like, you know, we, we, with the 15 meters, it, it's just enough to go, to go upstairs. And the glaciers comes with the Falcon 4, with the micro ED package, so the CETA D, EPUD, and the optimized uh, goniometer. Uh, it's performing quite well. This is standard apoferritin test overnight, went to one point uh, to Angstrom. And we started playing with micro fraction. The, 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 the limiting factor right now is time. And also the glaciers is the very first microscope of human technopole on which we are running serial EM. That's because time, you know, every microscope is gonna run serial EM. That's why we included, when we negotiated, we included the, the, the scriptings necessary to use serial EM. Okay, the Cryos G4 comes with the Selectris X, the Falcon 4, uh, uh, tomography software, EPU is gonna run serial EM. Uh, the thing of also like, you know, if you think something stupid like the enclosure, actually DDM can, couldn't travel from uh, the Netherlands because when we received the Titan cryos and the material for the enclosure, we were in the second heavy lockdown. So we were PCR tested kind of a lot and we had very limited uh, on-site access. So this was a real challenge. So the time lapse, it's what, 60 seconds, but actually took us a couple of weeks not a full day work, but just between, you know, we were waiting for the government to issue the new regulation to go on work. And we had special letter. I was traveling with this letter from Ian Matai, our director, to kind of show the police to, to say that, you know, my, 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 I had to go to work for specific reasons. And here you can see the, the delivery day and standard trials. We are kind of ready to sign off the Titan. The microscope is behaving really well. Actually, it's very stable, like, you know, get very some minimal uh, beam drift. And uh, the only thing that we're trying to fix and something you should be aware of for your radii, uh, if you're running 3.8 version of the server and you have a Selectris X, you might already know that you have some serious mag calibration issue and something that uh, if you're lucky enough, as some of you are listening, you, have, you already have the 3.9, then you, know, you don't care about this, but uh, it's something that you should really keep an eye on. But the microscope, we are very happy. So I guess that you know maybe in a couple of weeks, it will be completely signed off. 
The control room. So I told you we are not operating the microscopes in the room. So this is kind of near my, my office. So this is what it looked like, not one year ago actually, because one year ago was completely like, you know, uh, uh, they didn't even have walls. So this is how it looks today. So we have the cryos, um, control desks, and the glaciers. They're like 10 meters apart. So we're, let me say something because Sonia actually, she raised a really good point. So we're not open. Like it's, we, we, we have to fulfill the scientific demand of the research community in Italy. So it's not in the plan to provide services to industry. But of course, also in academia, you can have some uh, MDA to, to sign. So uh, we already know that if we need to kind of um, provide confidentiality, we can put some separators between the control desks. Um, the free desk that you see, they're actually uh, free to use by any users, because my idea is that if you have to do some uh, alignments, data analysis or processing, given that we have only virtual desktops, so basically you can process data anywhere in human technical. You, you book the, 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 the desk, you, you stay there. And if you have any issue, if you want to ask anything, there's always uh, someone collecting data either on the glaciers and the Titans, so you can share ideas. So let's see how it goes. Um, the cryo clamp. So we decided like, you know, years ago to have this uh, hybrid EM facility. So uh, we purchased um, the Stellaris 5, which is the, the, the latest version of the confocal to do cryo clamp. Uh, the one that you see being built on the left. On the right, you see the white field, which is the Leica Thunder. Uh, I have to say that, you know, we are still commissioning the facility, but people, they already started to use the, especially the Thunder. They're a bit afraid of the confocal. I don't know why, but the Thunder, like in 20 minutes, they can get nice, uh, a nice map inflorescence and then they go to the to the oculus to, to the oculus and then to the side we also have a spectra 300 uh, only for room temperature applications so a stem microscope uh with dual tip holder it's been delivered a month ago and it will take the next two three months we have we bought five voltages for the alignment so our fsc engineer is having a blast he can't wait to to play on the spectrum uh, plus, you know, as I told you, let me check my time. Okay, we had, I, I had to start from absolutely scratch during a pandemic. We had absolutely nothing, not even PBS or a pair of tweezers. So um, we, 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 we kind of uh, uh, split the, the facility in four, into four different pre sample preparation areas. So quickly, this is the one with the, 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 the lowest uh, relative humidity is very tiny. It can fit maximum two people. And here, ideally, they would do clipping, handling. Uh, there's a bit of both for, uh, uh, there's a bit of for plunging. And the relative humidity maximum, it's 15%. On average, it's between like, you know, it's 11. So that's like, you know, you can, you can stay there forever. Not you, I mean, your sample, because after 15 minutes, your throat is going to feel a bit dried. We also have a general all-purpose uh, sample prep lab where we had the Leica EMGP2, we have the GlowQ Plus, the Solaris 2, and an, a hydrogen generator, which, is, which was the only way to actually get some hydrogen in the room. Uh, it's something that, you know, they, they're not so expensive. They're very safe because they produce nitrogen on the go for the plasma cleaner. Then we have the entire crowd clan room. It's, uh, Again, with control relative humidity, we get an average 15%, which is very good because we don't get a lot of contaminations when you do your paraclam experiment. Uh, the other half of the room, we have the uh, cryo ultra microtome, we have knife maker, the, the, the trimmer, and the high pressure freezer. Then we have another <laughs> sample prep lab, uh, which is not relative humidity control. It's an all-purpose standard EM lab where we put the second vitro bot, uh, the pre-substitution device, the carbon coater, uh, another easy glow and some general equipment. And I'm late already, sorry. Uh, the other thing that I was caring a lot about is to uh, a live monitoring system to get temperature and relative humidity of uh, all the rooms of the EM facility. So we, we kind of, this very nice system where you receive alerts on the, by, via email 
uh, if the, 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 the parameters you set uh, are, not, are not right. Uh, I also have to think about the booking system and I have demoed three different uh, systems and I ended up uh, choosing the one that is being used also by the MBL, which is Stratocos PTMS, which is, I think, really easy to implement. They don't need to register. They can use the human technical uh, credentials. You can get all the statistics and, you know, it's very nice because I can also um, ask for specific questions when they have to ask for a training. So if they, when they start, usually they have to fill up this very basic um, training form where they say uh, where they come from and what they know how to use. Training the best practice. And that's how I lost my dignity with the GoPro. And we are filming everything. We are using OneNote to make very fast uh, protocols to be shared with users. Uh, actually, you can use also, you can put some audio messages in, the, in, in, in OneNote. So like, you know, if, they, if, they, if you really want to remark some uh, step of your protocol, you can also record yourself. Uh, tweezers, uh, the storage system, we have the canonical uh, Christmas tree. So the spaghetti monsters with the HC 35 or 34 with the Falcon tubes and string, but we also have the pack system by the Bankstrom. They started using it last week, so I don't have any data on contamination rates, but you know, I hope that you know in a year I can give you something. Tweezers, 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 quantiful, 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 uh, uh, prototypes, C flat, whatever you can think of. Uh, of we, we actually had to buy from scratch. Uh, any kind of viewer, so from the big one to the small one, the, the, and actually speaking of nitrogen, something that I think it's pretty banal, but pretty useful is that it's called secure fill. It's kind of a liquid nitrogen dispenser, which it's really the, faces, the safest way to dispense nitrogen. Here you can see Simona uh, acting in the video. You just use a badge to, um, to uh, kind of turn on the system so I can also track who went to take the nitrogen and also just a drying cabinet to get rid of humidity which currently is really really low done i think i'm five minutes late uh, i haven't talked about uh the it which is fantastic here human technical and if he, there is anything else you want to know about just you know reach out anytime i'll be very happy to share anything Thank you very much, Paolo, for the great talk and uh, the follow-up on your uh, <laughs> adventure <laughs> in building the human technical facility. And I'm um, actually, you know, as an Italian, I'm very glad that you guys are finally setting up one. Uh, now we transition from how to build a facility more on how the different operation models are. The first talk will be uh, from uh, Christos, Christos Saba at Leicester University. Uh, the title of the talk is Acrayan Facility for the UK Midlands. And Christos, the stage is yours. Thank you, Simone. Thank you. Thank you for the organizers for inviting me to give you an overview today on our facility and tell you how we came to be and what we're doing here. Uh, so um, many of you may not know much about the Midlands in, the, in, the, in England. So this is a map of England. Uh, and it's pretty much a region in the middle of, of, of England, just between the south and the, and the north. And it hosts some major cities in, in the UK, including the second biggest uh, city in the UK, which is Birmingham. Uh, included is Leicester, Coventry, Nottingham, and lots of other small ones. Um, so uh, it also hosts the, the corresponding universities in these regions, the University of Leicester, Nottingham, Birmingham, and the University of Warwick, as well as some smaller ones such as Loughborough, Wolverhampton, and Aston University in Birmingham. So there's quite a, a few academic places uh, located here in the Midlands, and there's quite a strong structural biology presence. And uh, it, it was basically mostly NMR and extra crystallography back in 2016. But um, there was a, one group in Warwick that was doing a full time cry uh, which was established prior to the resolution revolution, let's say, and a group in Leicester that was also uh, just starting to get up with cry -M. So we had all these uh, uh, structural biology groups in the Midlands 
uh, and they wanted to take advantage of phylic microscopy, which was the new uh, technique that everybody wanted to use. So if we look at the topography of uh, 300 kilovolt uh, microscopes with autoloaders in 2016, 2017 period, we can see that most of them were clustered in the south of England. And a lot of these microscopes were not accessible to outside users, particularly ones in London and, and Cambridge. And so the EPIC was getting started. They had uh, two or three microscopes at this time and possibly one in, the, in one of the universities there. And of course, Leeds had just established their, um, their, um, their two cryosis up in the, in the north of England. But there was a, a need for uh, cryom access in our region, in the Midlands. So the four universities got together and applied for money from the UK Research Councils, and they were awarded a grant in 2017. And, and this three and a half million pound grant was topped up by University of Leicester and the universities of Birmingham, Nottingham and Warwick to kind of put together a regional cryo facility that could accommodate these four universities and the smaller ones around the region. So the main purchases from this grant were a Thermo Fisher Titan Cryos, as well as a smaller uh, screening microscope that would be located at the University of Warwick. Furthermore, we had to uh, refurbish the existing um, space here in the Leicester Institute of Structural and Chemical Biology, which was already housing X-ray and NMR facilities. And then finally, as everybody has mentioned, um, you have to dedicate some amount of money to to set up your uh, processing facilities. So uh, this is just an up-to-date uh, um, kind of map now of all the uh, instruments in the UK. And you can see that uh, there's a few more that have popped up since 2016, including uh, ours, some more down in the south, and one in Glasgow, which uh, is unique to the rest of them because um, they, they have the jail cryam 300, the rest of them as far as I know, are all uh, Thermo Fisher instruments. So our microscope was delivered end of 2017, just before Christmas, and the crates were all kept in, uh, uh, in the NMR room <laughs> over Christmas until installation could begin in January. Uh, the installation began and took approximately five weeks to assemble, so quite fast. It was done by a uh, a company in uh, Poland called Lapsov that was subcontracted by Thermo. They did a really good, uh, efficient job, I have to say. And after a few glitches um, that we were able to sort out, we signed off just before Easter towards the, the end of March. So these are just some pictures of the, of the initial installation. Just to point out here something unique with this installation was the provision of trunking in the flooring, which could accommodate um, uh, all the cabling. So here is what the finished installation looks like. So in the cryos room, of course, the microscope itself, and you can see how nice and clean behind the microscope is. It makes it nice to easy to go there without tripping over the wires. And here's our control room. It's a separate room that looks into the cryos room and is quite comfortable. We have the, the cryos PC and monitors, the K3 PC, and, uh, and the support PC, which connects to all the other um, computers via VNC, uh, including a, a warp PC that we have set up for processing uh, on the fly monitoring. So uh, even though it was shipped with a K2, we had a voucher to upgrade to a bi-quantum K3, which is the configuration we have now. Uh, we also, we have the Falcon 3 detector, which we use quite a bit initially, but I have to say now the majority of data sets are acquired using the, the K3. We have the Volta faceplate, which we do still use occasionally. We still think there's some use for it and challenging samples. And just this July, we finished an upgrade to Windows 10 and to uh, adjust the stage so we could do fringe-free uh, illumination. So this is our current configuration as of July. In addition, we had to refurbish the area to, to provide areas where we could do our uh, sample prep. And one of the uh, lab spaces that was set up was a dry lab. So with, um, it's dehumidified by an active system outside, quite big, and, and keeps the humidity um, below 
20%, usually around 17%. And like Paolo mentioned, it's a, it's a really great thing to, feels a little bit like a luxury, but it's a really nice thing to have. Um, it uh, basically you can work for quite a while without getting too much ice on your samples. So we have a, the Vitrobot, we have a custom-made manual plunger that we use, and this is the area that uh, where, we, where we clip our samples uh, followed into the microscope. So everything is nice and dehumidified. And you can look into the control room and beyond to the microscope room. We also have uh, some ancillary equipment and we have a quorum glow cube for glow discharging. And we just take in delivery of a carbon coater and the, the Leica A600, which I demoed a few months ago and actually was quite impressed with. Um, so it, it produces really nice thin carbon and one of our um, kind of test specimens which is a small membrane protein, uh, easily gets to 2.1 angst on resolution. It gives you very nice uniform uh, um, kind of coverage uh, with the carbon produced from this instrument. Of course, we had to set up our computational cluster and the person responsible for running and maintaining this is Dr. T.J. Reagan. He's a structural biologist uh, who did a lot of NMR in his, uh, in his days and is now competent in doing CRI-M as well. And so uh, he, he's not an IT person. He doesn't like to be called an IT person, but he, he can do all this stuff. <laughs> he can basically do his job and my job, uh, putting it uh, simply. But uh, TJ basically built this um, cluster, high performance cluster from, sc from scratch pretty much. And this is the hardware that we have uh, to date. So we have about 1.1 petabytes of usable um, storage. And we have 14 uh, GPU-based nodes. Our first six nodes have the, which were bought initially in 2018, have the 1080 TIs, and we have eight new compute nodes with uh, RTX 3070 um, uh, GPUs for processing. And this is a, a, just an overview of how everything is set up. So uh, gaining access to, access to a cluster is pretty straightforward. All our Midlands partners have um, four GPU allocation per user to process the data. But uh, anybody that collects data here at Leicester can have access to our, to our cluster to process the data for free. And, and we generally uh, ask them to finish the processing within three months, so extensions are possible. We provide two GPU allocations per project with a maximum of four per lab. Uh, it is also possible to lease a node from us, and uh, companies have been particularly um, keen to uptake this option. And then um, uh, Liz also showed that they use Globus. Uh, Globus is a very nice uh, system for transferring data. So for users who want to just move the data off to process on their own site, it offers a nice uh, GUI for doing, doing so. The microscope, I have to say, has been uh, Quite, uh, quite reliable and with uh, very little downtime. We've had our share of problems, uh, several face plates, several uh, IGPs, everybody has issues with the micro, but it's been pretty good. The room stability combined with a good uh, energy filter means that it's a very stable system. So we do not use auto zero P centering um, in EPU. And we do our apopheritin benchmarking like everybody else after any major upgrade. The most recent one was done after our fringe tree uh, upgrade. And we try to make things uh, as easy as possible for our users. So we have EPU presets that users can just load based on the magnification they want to collect that and what type of grid they're using. So we find this really speeds up the data collection process. They do have to check the, the final dose, of course, on the day, but we, we find this doesn't change too much. In fact, most users are now using one preset. Uh, we do the gift tuning and gain uh, collection for most users. And um, these are the current speeds that we're kind of reaching after our fringe free upgrade. And, uh, and we've kind of settled on 105,000, which is a decent pixel size for most projects. And also if you look at the, the speed in uh, kind of a field of view per hour, it's actually, even though you've got less, image, less images per hour, you're actually acquiring a bigger field of view per hour. So this is what most of our users actually use. So how do users access our facility? And um, so new 
uh, Midlands users can email us to, to start a, a new project. Like keep in mind that all of these labs, um, some of them are structured biology labs, so I've been doing x-ray and NMR, but a lot of them are, can be cell biology or biochemistry labs. So myself and uh, Saskia Becker, who's based at Warwick, help them with the initial feasibility studies. And then once a project matures a little more, it can move over to Leicester and um, users can actually uh, optimize conditions further here in Leicester and collect short data sets to kind of really um, evaluate how good their sample is for, for collection. Um, we can train um, all the users on all aspects of the, the, uh, of the process. One of the things that we found is especially useful for us. We do have a, a second screening microscope here at Leicester, but this was really inaccessible during the, the pandemic um, due to um, um, kind of social, social distancing. But what we found really useful and we, we keep doing now is uh, every Monday we have three users joining a, uh, joining on a cryo session, they load four grids each and they can use their two, three hour slot to either screen grids or to collect small data sets. And in two, three hours you, these days, you can collect, um, you know, over a thousand images. So uh, this can be quite useful for evaluating samples. So apart from the one-to-one -one training, it's really important to try and, and get all the information out there to our, to our partners. So we host an annual CRIM workshop and um, this has been kind of face-to-face -face, uh, and uh, with, with practicals uh, here at Leicester with four participants from each university uh, on all aspects of CRIM. But unfortunately last year we had to cancel and this, uh, we've had one in March this year, which was online. And it was, you know, we couldn't do the practical aspects, but we were able to appeal to a larger audience because this was done remotely. So we, uh, we hope to be able to post the videos and lectures on our website soon. And I'll make, uh, I'll send an email out to everyone when these are available. Uh, and then finally, to kind of top up the training, we have a meeting every, every Thursday. It's called our Digital Processing Club. And this is where people can just log in kind of informally, chat about CryEM, ask issues about CryEM, image processing, sample prep, data collection. It's organized by TJ. It's open to all our users, um, Midlands uh, users and external users. Anybody wants to join, the more the merrier, really, because you get more brains thinking about something. Um, and uh, like a lot of facilities, we are working remotely. And our facility was actually um, remote capable before COVID, thanks to our users in Europe. And, but this has really worked out really well because it allows a lot of, um, of our external users just to send samples and get them on the cryos and um, using TeamViewer to, to log into the cryo support PC and then VNC into the cryos, it's really, it works, it works pretty well. Most of our users are happy with this setup. Um, right, so um, how have we uh, done over the last three and a half years? So these are currently the groups in the Midlands that are working on projects related to CRIEM. These are not full-time CRIEM groups. Uh, I would say about half, a third to half are actually structural biology groups. The rest of them are groups that want to dabble in CRIEM. But you can see we've gone from two groups and um, working in CRIEM to over 20 now, um, which, are, which are working on CRIEM projects. In addition, we have external groups from uh, UK and Europe and industry as well. And we welcome industry, industry use because they, they will um, help us with covering the really expensive service contracts, which we will have to pay once our warranty, five-year warranty is over. And these, as you know, cost over £250,000 a year. Uh, in addition to that, we're hoping that these, um, income, this income will uh, help pay towards some of the upgrades that we hope to do in a few years. Uh, and as far as uh, output from the cryos, we've determined an excess of 40 structures so far. This have led to about 18 publications. And we, some of these structures have gone sub three, sub two angstrom, uh, which is uh, just to illustrate really that the microscope works very well. And uh, you know, it works on other stuff apart from aquaferritin as well. Just a few highlights here, including the first 
um, human DNA polymerase that uh, synthesizes Okazaki fragments was solved by Alfredo de Biasio here in, in uh, Leicester. Uh, a group in Warwick, Alex Cameron's group, solved this 1.9 angstrom um, gap junction channel, which was really cool. They used different amounts of CO2 to kind of see the conformational changes in the gap junction channel. Uh, an external user, Shores Shares, uh, did one of his chronic somatic encephalopathy samples here at Leicester, uh, which was published back in 2019. And we work on quite a few um, transcription and regulators here at Leicester. And uh, this is one of the examples here. Here's a little gallery of, of, of um, some of the structures that we solved here. This would be cooler if we arranged it by size. I, I will do that one day. And what have we learned in the three and a half years? So a regional data collection facility works well. You can think of it a little bit like EBIC for the Midlands. So that part works really well. People can ship the samples, we collect nice data for them. And the challenging thing is getting uh, projects off the ground. So it, it requires manpower and the buildup of a nucleus of knowledge in these different universities to be able to, to, to do the experiments and then propagate the knowledge to other members uh, so that they, you can increase the number of, of users. And moving forward, I would say that um, our regional partners, um, it would be good for them to have local PREPS facilities. So they can go, for example, from the actor to the Vitrobot without having to wait overnight or travel. And ideally, one day we would like to have local facilities um, at these uh, universities. So with that, I'd like to, to thank the people here in Leicester and our regional partners for making that, and the funding, of course, from the Medical Research Council. And I'll take any questions that you have. Thank you very much, Christos, for the great talk. Thank you. So, Christos. Sure. So, Sarah, are you able to share? Oh, okay, you're still muted. There we go. <laughs> okay, so welcome to the um, last speaker of uh, this session and today's uh, session, Sarah Schneider. Uh, Sarah is from EMBL Grenoble, but today she will talk from our uh, site in EMBL Heidelberg, and the title of her talk is A Smallish Facility for Smallish Province, Strategies to make it, make it Work. Sarah, stage is yours. Thank you. Uh, yeah, we're going to change pace quite a bit. Um, so no Krios envy here. Um, good afternoon to you all, and I'm going to introduce you to um, my facility. Um, I have been a young facility manager since um, 2020, uh, September 2020. It's been a year. And um, the, the um, facility is in a very nice environment with lots of mountains. So that makes for good uh, views during lunch break. And the uh, um, quite big arrow there denotes where, where EMBL is. Um, so we are embedded and, and basically too comfy. Um, so we have the, the fact that we're part of EMBL, uh, which has a lot of sites. So we are in contact with the SCB unit, of course, and, and Heidelberg and with, uh, with the new imaging center people. Um, but uh, we are also um, uh, on, the, on the EPN campus where we have IBS um, as neighbors and the ESRF cryos and synchrotron. Um, I mean, EMBL, Grenoble, and, and, and the uh, French Alps uh, used to be quite a lot of uh, crystallography. Um, so all these groups that I show here, we have eight groups on site. Um, I think, yeah, a lot of them have been uh, X-ray and are moved into EM. Um, we have um, 25 active users. Um, almost all these groups have, yeah, all, have one user at least. And um, for such a really like 70, 80 people, so it's, it's quite a lot of um, users, I would say, but much less than, than, than other facilities we heard about today. Um, so we have a uh, basic kit to do EM, I guess. Um, we have a, a vitro bot um, with an ethane uh, um, yeah, uh, supply and the T12 and the glaciers. 
to uh, do internal research. Uh, there's also collaborations going on, but we don't have any external users. The team is basically me. Um, so I'm a jack of all trades now. Uh, and then there is Michael Hans, who's also working on the ESF, Krios helping, and Wojtek Gale. What I do is uh, instrument maintenance. I, I plan instrument upgrades a little bit, of course, um, a little bit to my wishes as well. Um, and then I maintain stocks for consumables. Um, I do all the training on, on the instruments and uh, also help with the initial, initial stages of processing. I support the users every day, which is probably the, yeah, the chunk that takes the most time. And uh, also have some scientific collaborations uh, with two groups at the moment. And um, I wanted to let you know what our workflow is from negative stain to, uh, to the CRIOS in the end. Uh, so that um, starts uh, with the T12, obviously. So I, I really like these um, kind of custom made solutions that every facility has. So I thought I introduced you to ours. So we have a common grid stock so that all the new users uh, and th those with difficult projects and so on can, can use all kinds of um, grids, but it also means uh, I have to order them. So that's good as well for the users. They don't have to think about that. Um, for some reason, the Quantifoil 300 mesh one, two, one, threes are by far the most uh, uh, sought after. So in case um, you haven't tried them, maybe it's a good idea. We have um, the uh, some some devices to make dual transport easier, especially if you have your back pain, you can roll it around and, and be more safe about it. The ethane melter for the VitroBot because our ice always, our ethane always freezes very, very quickly within a minute or so you're, you're back to a solid. And um, this box gripper that I really like for for your pin type um, boxes. Um, so then the next step would be going to the glaciers. And um, here we have just a few tools. Uh, so we have the auto grid inspector tool that I really like for my own grids if I if I'm not so sure about one of them and really like also for for users that maybe are beginners so you can test again whether they're fine and uh, whether they're loaded in the correct uh, orientation. And uh, the subangstrom packs, um, which are brilliant. Also, sometimes it's hard to, uh, to get the, the packs out, I have to say. So that's what we are struggling with at the moment a little bit. Um, and then uh, for, for slots, maybe it could be interesting. We, we have a lot of small proteins um, for the title. So that maybe explains why we um, also need counting and um, have these long slots, I think, in contrast to other people. So we have one two-day slot, uh, one three-day slot, and uh, two 24-hour slots. Um, on uh, the sample, uh, so we have, yeah, only single particle, no tomography whatsoever um, in the facility. Um, if I, yeah, if I at some point want to do tomography, I first have to learn that <laughs> as well. Um, and 99% EPU, we have CRM installed uh, since spring, but uh, there's a steep learning curve and uh, yeah, it has to gain some momentum. Then for um, the proteins, um, um, I mean, I, uh, as I said, there was there were a lot of X-ray groups in the in the facility in the institute. So I before I came here, I um, made a little survey, went to every user uh, that I could find, and uh, asked them what their number was and molecular weight. Uh, so it turns out the majority of Envergonova samples are between 80 and 180 kilo Dalton. There are uh, quite a lot also that are really large, um, one, one mega Dalton and bigger, but that's uh, one group, the Galei group. Um, so people have uh, developed some strategies to, to deal with this. And I've, I've asked them. So the, the stuff I could gather is obviously anecdotal evidence, but maybe it helps someone. Um, one thing is high protein concentration. Um, but I also heard the opposite, uh, that low concentration is actually uh, more helpful. So there you go. Um, RNA helps. RNA has, uh, gives a lot of signal. 
Um, a lot of people, as I said, uh, freeze with gold mesh uh, and even ultrafoil to get the nice. Uh, counting mode is, is quite beneficial in that area. And uh, in order to say, like, can I actually acquire on this? It's quite useful to know that the particles are at my is visible at minus one uh, one point zero defocus. So then you can you can hope for good data. So um, for the computational side, how do we deal uh, with um, with that side? So for remote operation, um, we have two screens on the uh, microscope PC. Um, so we have to move EPU, which we mainly use, uh, to the main screen at the end of the day in order to uh, for it to be visible. Uh, after second accessing the support PC um, via screen sharing or remote desktop app. And then from the support PC, we are the VNC viewer to access the microscope PC. I mean, most of you guys is probably super um, uh, obvious, but I thought I, I share it in case it helps someone out there. Uh, one of the rules at the moment is uh, that we don't change grids remotely. Then um, when we have the data, I thought it would be also useful uh, to share what kind of um, yeah. A hard disk we have and how we deal with it. So our offload data, um, where the data arrives is about 60 terabytes, uh, so it needs to be emptied very regularly by the users themselves, um, which is then transferred to the group share, which is um, shared between the groups, so they have to communicate well, and uh, we have to communicate well in the CryoSpark folder, which everyone shares. Uh, currently 95 terabytes, it does grow. Uh, quite a lot, um, but yeah, there's some discipline uh, needed in that area for, for the users. And then once there's a publication, EMBL has a central archiving um, unit that we take full uh, uh, use of, uh, advantage of. Uh, so for training strategy, um, so I've trained 11 users so far. So I used to be a user until this uh, job came along. So it was also a journey into that. Um, so I try to do one on two um, training if possible to make it more efficient. Uh, two sessions on every instrument. So meaning a negative stain room temperature is one um, item. Then VitroBot the next, uh, Cryo the next and um, on the T12 and then glaciers. So all these uh, parts need two sessions in my opinion so far and then observe the critical parts like insertion and um, yeah, these th things. Uh, I try to stick uh, to fixed days. Uh, I tried Tuesday and Thursday um, quite unsuccessfully recently, but uh, in the beginning it worked. Um, then for the specifics, this is for all the items. Uh, I um, always start with negative stay no matter what uh, to practice grid handling. And uh, when I tried once without, it, it was clear it's necessary to just use the tweezers. Um, plan a lot of time for the first feature bot session because there's so much to cover from boxes and uh, um, storing of the pucks and so on. That's not even the feature bot part. And then I noticed that um, if I just um, have the user uh, and uh, practice the insertion of the cryo holder with room temperature, it uh, makes everything much more relaxed. So someone might be finding that useful information. Um, this is, uh, by the way, a uh, street art in Grenoble, which there's a lot of uh, and depicts the synchrotron. That's pretty cool. Um, so what does, what do I think uh, makes the facility tick at EMBL? So we have these EM seminars that are now maybe due to COVID um, virtual, so we can all participate. And I think that's really cool. Um, in Grenoble, we have uh, local informal journal clubs, short 15 to 30 minutes, mostly PhD and postdocs only show up and we just chat about the paper. Um, so I, I got inspired by Twitter and uh, uh, how some people have sweets. So I, I now do an end of glacier session chocolate, which you can take um, no matter how successful your session was, but you have to fill in the logbook. <laughs> 
Um, so for um, what's also quite useful, I think, is in the M facility manager as a shoulder to vent and cry on. So that kind of uh, relieves some stress and frustration, I think, and uh, then we are a nicer community, hopefully. Um, one thing that is maybe more in my interest than, than anyone else, like um, I found it difficult to, to do this transition to, to uh, a manager just because there's so much to learn and uh, desperately want some information and it's not always readily available. Um, so how I learned is if there's a problem with the microscope, I can learn from the engineers and I just be there. I'm, I'm there for, for the whole day and uh, ask them lots of stuff um, from the users, from Twitter, Slack, 3DM. Um, so you see, for example, that, that one problem we had with the um, humidity in the glaciers. <laughs> And uh, yeah, some, some Twitter images of, of a doer that someone uh, uh, disassembled. Um, I think there should be some, some better way to, to get all this information than one by one um, and learning by doing. But yeah, that is kind of what, what I've been thinking about. And with that, I'm already at the end. And I want to acknowledge the Ember Grenoble community, the whole of it, uh, also EM, that these are all the people uh, circled in the right circle. So these are all my M users, uh, like LA group, um, Wojtek, obviously, um, EM support group uh, with uh, Michael and Wojtek and formerly Erika and the administration. And you for your attention. <laughs>